Um, so we're talking about joint distributions, right? And there's a lot more to do with, with that, so just, just, just continue. Um, so last time we, did, we, did, we calculated the expected uh, distance between two IID uniforms, okay? So I wanted to do this uh, analogous problem for the normal, because, because I, I think that that's a, uh, another nice related example that has a different approach that makes it easier, okay? So last time we did expected uh, absolute difference. This is just an example, but I think it's a nice example. Uh, expected absolute difference between two uniforms, and what if we want to do the same thing with normals? So we want to find the expected value of, let's say, um, let's call them Z1 and Z2. So we did this with the uniform last time. Now assume these are IID standard normal. Okay, so last time we did this for uniform using the 2D version of Lotus, right? Completely analogous to Lotus, except we had a double integral instead of a single integral. Uh, so these are IID standard normal. So we could write down the 2D Lotus here and try to do that integral, and because they're IID, the, the joint PDF of Z1 and Z2 is just, is just the product of the two marginal PDFs, and well, we could just try to do that integral, and we could probably get it you know, with, with some effort. But that's not a good way to do this problem. It's better to stop and think about the structure of the problem, okay? So in the case of the uniforms, we've, we've never particularly studied you know, what are the properties of the difference of two uniforms. On the other hand, the difference of normals is something we've talked about before. So instead of jumping right into this two-dimensional thing, let's see if we can actually simplify the problem first. So in, in fact, um, we've mentioned before that, that the sum of independent normals is normal. We haven't proven that, that yet, but we have all the tools to be able to prove that, that now. So let's just do that quickly. Uh, to verify what, what I said before about the sum of normals, so just a little you know, theorem. This is going to be easy now because, because we know MGFs. Uh, the sum of normals, so we stated this before, uh, if, if x is, let's say, normal mu1 sigma1 squared and, and y is normal mu2 sigma2 squared and they're independent, x has to be independent of y, otherwise this won't work. Then the sum, we talked about this before, uh, by linearity, the means just add, and also um, the variances add. And we talked about the fact that if we took a difference, we, we would take the difference of means, but we would, we would still add the variances, not subtract. Because, because you could, if this were minus y, you would just think of it as plus minus y, okay? So anyway, let, let, let's just prove this fact now, uh, which we haven't done yet. And this is just an easy MGF calculation. Uh, use, so we just use the MGFs. So let's get the MGF of x plus y. Since they're independent, we've talked about the fact that since they're independent, we can just multiply the MGF of x times the MGF of y. The MGF of a normal, well, we, de we derived the MGF of a standard normal before, but it's very easy to get from the standard normal to any normal, right? We do this thing like mu plus sigma z, and we can immediately get the MGF of any normal, and that's just going to be uh, e to the mu 1 t, this is the MGF of x, mu 1 t plus 1 half sigma 1 squared t squared. That's the MGF of x. We multiply by the MGF of Y, which is the same thing, just change the subscripts, mu 2 T plus 1 half sigma 2 squared T squared equals, now let's just write this as one exponential uh, and factor, so that's E to the mu 1 plus mu 2 T, just factor, factor out the T, plus 1 half, this is all up in the exponent, 1 half t squared, sigma 1 squared plus sigma 2 squared, right? Sigma 1 squared plus sigma 2 squared t squared. Okay, well, I ran out of space on this board, but that, that's the end of the proof. Because all we have to do is just say, look, that's the, that's the MGF. 
Oh, we have a little more space. That's the MGF of, the no of normal mu1 plus mu2 sigma1 squared plus sigma2 squared, right? So since the MGF determines the distribution, then that, that's the end. Don't have to do anything else. So it's, it's a very easy calculation using MGFs. Okay. So now that we've proven that fact and we see this thing Z1 minus Z2, rather than jumping into the 2D lotus, let's, let's just say, what is that? Well, note that Z1 minus Z2 is normal 0, 2. Just add the variances. So really all we're asking is for the expected value of expected value of uh, absolute value of now when we see normal zero two let's, let's let's again think of that as location and scale right we, we we could take a standard normal and multiply by the square root of two and that would give us variance two so the easiest way to think of this is as square root of two times z where z is standard normal right that's just the scale that gives it variance two now this is just square root of 2 times expected absolute value of z. Now it's just a one-dimensional lotus. And this is, this is a lotus that you've actually seen if you studied strategic practice 5. We, we, we did this, but if, whether you remember or lo ever looked at that or not doesn't matter. This is, this is an easy lotus, whereas here is I have to do a double integral. Here, just, just write down lotus. So I'll do this quickly because it's on the strategic practice. Just write down lotus integral minus infinity to infinity absolute z lowercase z 1 over root 2 pi e to the minus z squared over 2 dz. And notice that that, that it is, this is an even function. That is, if we replace z by minus z, we get the same thing. So we can just T multiply by 2 and go from 0 to infinity. And then, uh, and, and once we go from 0 to infinity, we can drop the absolute values. And that's just z e to the minus z squared over 2. That's a really easy u substitution integral, right? Because you can just let u equal z squared or, or u equals z squared over 2 if, if you like. And then you get exactly what you want. So that, that, that's then an easy integral. Uh, and if you uh, simplify it, you get square root 2 over pi which should be an easy calculation. It's also on the strategic practice, so I won't write out more of that calculation. Um, so then that becomes just a simple one-dimensional lotus. That, that, that's a much better way to think of it. All right, so not just, just, just an example that you, know, you don't always have to jump into the 2D lotus just because you have this function of, of two variables. OK, so uh, that's a continuous example. I wanted to do some more discrete stuff in particular to introduce the multinomial distribution, um, which is by far the most important discrete multivariate distribution. And I'll tell you what multivariate distribution means. So this is going to be called the multinomial. Uh, a multivariate distribution just, just means a distribution that, that's a joint distribution for, you know, for, for, for more than one. Uh, random variable, right? So, so we have all these, you know, normals and Poissons and 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 uh, geometrics and so on. Those are all univariate distributions because we have one random variable. Now we're working with more than one random variable at once. And for this course, there's really only two multivariate distributions that you need to know by name. One is the multinomial, which we're about to do. The other one is the multivariate normal which is the generalization of the normal distribution to, to higher dimensions, and, and we'll, we'll get to that one la later. Okay, so multinomial, as the name might suggest, it's, it's a generalization of the binomial, right? Bi becomes multi, okay? So, so it's, 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 it's like a higher dimensional version of the uh, binomial, and let's just introduce it by, uh, by its story. So this is the definition and story of the multinomial, which I'll sometimes just abbreviate to, to MULT of NP. It has two parameters, N and P, like the binomial, except in this case, P, this P is actually a vector. So P equals a vector, let's say P1 through PK, where we assume that um, that's a probability vector. 
And by probability vector, all I mean is that these are non-negative and add up to one, because we're going to think of them as probabilities for disjoint cases. So we want, uh, you know, that encompass all possibilities. So we want um, pj greater than or equal to zero, and the sum of all the pj's equals one. That, that's the assumption, OK? So the, bi the binomial would just be if this is one dimensional, and then we just have binomial np. But now we have k of them. OK? So, so the intuition is that uh, in the binomial, we just talked about success and failure, right? There are two possible outcomes. There are two categories. Multinomial means instead of two categories, we have k categories, OK? So it's a natural extension, right? And binomial, we have to classify everything as either success or failure for each trial. Here, we have more than two possible uh, results, OK? So, so um, we say that uh, x is multinomial uh, np. We think of that as, as, as saying that, that um, so in this case, x equals, uh, x is also a vector. This is a multivariate distribution. So x equals x1 to xk. If we can think of uh, x, uh, so, so, so like in the binomial, we have n independent trials. Uh, but I'll just call them uh, objects in, instead of trials. And each object, objects you know, could be people, could be trials, could, could, be, could be anything. So just a very general. We have n objects that we are, that we are categorizing. Okay? We have n objects which, which we are independently uh, putting into k categories. So there are k possible categories. In the binomial, it's just success or failure. But now we have k categories. And, and they're in each, each object, it's independently determined which category it falls into, OK? Just like in the binomial, we had independent Bernoulli trials. And if pj is the probability of category uh, j, that is one, by, by p of category j, I mean the probability that any one of these objects is in category j has probability pj. And we interpret xj is just the count is the number of objects in category J. All right, so that was a lot of writing, but the, the concept is really simple. We just have n things that we're breaking them into categories, and then we just see how many objects are in each category, right? So it's very natural. You can, you can make up as many examples of, of this as you want, like, you know, really easily, right? Just, just any time you're classifying things into categories. It's very, very general. OK, so let, let's find the, the PMF. So this is going to be a joint PMF, because it's a joint distribution. So we want the probability that x1 equals n1, blah, 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 xk equals nk. All right, that's a joint PMF. We just need to say, you know, what's the probability that there are n1 objects in the first category, n2 in the second category, and, and so on. And we can immediately write down the answer just, just by th thinking back to how, how do we derive the binomial PMF. Um, I'll, I'll, you know, all we have to do is imagine any particular sequence. It's going to be p1 to the n1, p2 to the n2, blah, 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 pk to the nk. Just to have a little intuitive example in, in mind, well, let, let's just suppose this, this is very similar to how we did the binomial, but just to quickly review and generalize that. Suppose we just had three categories, just, just to have a little mental picture in mind. We had three categories, and let's just call, let's just say our sequence, and let's just write one, two, three, where one means category one, and, and so on. So we might have a sequence like, you know, two, three, three, one, 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 two, for example. Okay, so uh, well, let's put a couple more twos. So there are four twos, two threes, four ones, for example. This says that the first object is category two, category, right? We're just, we're just categorizing the objects one by one. So any particular sequence like this, would, would, the probability would be, you know, P1 um, is the probability of category one multiple to the power of how many ones there are, right? Let me put another one there. Um, P2 to the power of the number of twos and so on. That would be the probability of any specific sequence that, that, that has the desired counts, 
right? But then we can permute this however we want. And it's, it's going back to those counting problems, you know, how, how many ways are there to permute the letters in the word pepper or the, or the letter, letters in the word Mississippi or something like that, where you start with n factorial, but that overcounts because the twos could have been in any order, the threes could have been in any order, the ones could have been in any order, and so on. So you have to, you have to adjust for that overcounting, exactly like we did for the binomial. So we just divide by n1 factorial, n2 factorial, blah, 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 and k factorial to account for all the ways you could permute the threes, permute the ones, permute the twos. Of course, there's a constraint here. This is if n1 plus blah, 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 plus nk equals n. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense, right? Because we have n objects. We're assuming that every object is in exactly one category. So it wouldn't make sense if, if we added up these counts and they had too many or too few, makes no sense. So it's zero, zero otherwise. That is, if, if the sum of these n's is not this n, then it's, it's impossible, so it's zero. So that didn't require a calculation, it just required thinking about you know, an example like that and just the different ways to, to permute th things, right? Um, so that's, that's the joint PMF. It looks a lot like the binomial, right? So it's a generalization of the binomial when, when, when you have more than two categories. Um, so we'll come back to some other properties of the multinomial later, but just to do a couple quick properties to, to think about. Uh, you know, we could ask about the marginal distribution, conditional distribution, things like that. So let's think about the marginal distribution first. Okay, so, so we're letting x be multinomial and uh, p. Sometimes I'll subscript a k just to, just to indicate what, what the dimension is, so the, the number of categories. And we want, suppose we want the marginal, find the marginal uh, distribution of just one, one of these components, let's say xj. Right, so, that, so, so xj is just how many people or how many objects are in category j, right? And we, we want its marginal distribution, okay? Uh, what do you think that is? Yep, binomial, why did you say binomial? It's either, in, exactly, it's either in k or it isn't in k. So, you know, I mean, if, if you said, oh, you know, if you look at your notes, how do you get from joint distribution to marginal distribution, it would say, you'd have to take this thing and then do, do uh, k minus one sigma sign sum over all possible thing, you know, do, do a lot of algebra, you know, that, but that's not thinking about it, right? I mean, I mean to marginalize, we, we sum up the, the joint or we integrate in the continuous case, so we sum in the discrete case, sum over everything we don't want. Okay, but, but instead, let's just think about the story, think about what it means. As you just said, each of, each of these objects, either it's in category J or it isn't. We're assuming they're all independent trials. So if we define success to, to, to mean being in category J, success has prob the, the probability of success is PJ and there are N objects. So that's just immediate. I mean, I, I, didn't, I didn't write justification for this, but that, it just proved itself from the story. That, you know, it's, it's a complete proof just to say because the binomial, you know, it's independent Bernoulli trials, that's the probability of success. Okay, so we can get that immediately. <laughs> and in particular, that also gives us the mean and the variance without having to do a calculation. The expected value of xj equals npj and the expected value of the variance because we derived the variance of the binomial before, we don't need to re-derive that. We already know the variance of a binomial is NP1 minus P. Uh, so this is NPJ1 minus PJ. No additional work needed because we know it's binomial. Okay, so that, that's just immediate from thinking about what this means. Uh, so that, that's, that's one property. That, that's the marginals. And let, let, let's think about kind of some, something similar uh, let, 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 let's, let's call this, um, well, I call this the, a lumping property. What happened, the, 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 the question is, we, we have all these categories, what happens if we decide to, to merge certain categories together, right? 
Okay, so, so just to have an example in mind, uh, for, let, 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 let's let k equal 10, and let, let's, so, so we're thinking of x as a vector, x1 through x10, and just to have a concrete uh, example in mind, so, so this is multinomial, uh, let's say this is multinomial n, uh, you know, p1 through p10, and to have a concrete example in mind, well, let's imagine we're in a country that, 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 that has 10 political parties, okay, and, and you, t you take n, you know, take n people and assume that, you, you know, the people are independent of each other, and you want to know how many people are in the, fr and assume that everyone in, in this country is a member of one of these 10 parties, okay, and then, you, you know, you take, 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 the, take all these people and you say, okay, ask each person wh which party they're, they're in, X1 is the number of people in the first political party, X2 is the number in the second one, and so on, right? So that, that would be multinomial uh, if, if, the, if these are the probabilities of the different party memberships, all right? So now, uh, what I call the lumping property is what if, what, if we're, what if it's a country where it's, you know, there are only two dominant uh, parties and all the, all the other parties are, are much smaller, and so it might be kind of unwieldy to deal with this 10-dimensional vector. Maybe we want to compress all the third party, you know, the, so, so, so suppose that the first two are kind of the, the two dominant major parties and the rest of them are kind of minor, so we may want to just lump them together. That's why I call it the lumping property, lump all the other parties together. So what if we, so we, what if we considered, let's see, let um, y equal x1, x2, and then group all these ones together. So I'll just add them up, x3 plus blah, 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 plus x10, right? So, th so this would be like, you know, party one, party two, and then other third party grouped together. Without doing any, any calculation or algebra whatsoever, we can immediately write down the distribution of, of, of y. y is just going to be multinomial. Same n, and then all, all we've done is group group uh, the group the, the, these categories together. But then it's it's the same problem again. It's just that it has a larger probability. You just lump together all, all those, those p's. Okay, so this should be obvious from from, from the story, right? Because we combine. It's the same problem again. So it's just like, you know, we emphasize with the binomial, we can define success and failure however we want. Here we can, you know, rearrange the categories and whatever. The, the only thing we need is to make sure of is that each object is in exactly one category, okay? So it would not work if you can be in more than one category, be in no categories. But every, if, every ob if you define your categories such, such that that's true, that each, one is, each object is in exactly one, then you get multinomial didn't need to do any algebra or calculus to show that, so that's pretty nice. Similarly, let, 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 let's get the conditional distribution. So what, what if we wanted, so again, x is multinomial. What if we want a conditional distribution where, where we got to learn what x1 is, and we want the conditional distribution of the rest, given that we now know x1. So we want a con conditional, you might call it a conditional joint PMF because, because you're, you're given x1, let's say that we're given that x1 equals n1, okay? And then we want the conditional joint distribution of everything else. So we, we know exactly how many people are in the first category, but we don't know about the rest of them. Well, given that, that x1 equals n1, and we, we want the, the, the uh, joint uh, PMF of the rest, x2 through xk, still going to be multinomial, but we have to be a little bit careful with, with getting the parameters right. So now this is going to be uh, k minus 1 dimensional, cause, because we we're, we're, we're just, we, we know how many people are in the first category, but we're looking at the remaining k minus 1 categories. And the number of people, well, n minus, n1 are, have been allocated in, in, into the first party, okay? So we have n minus n1 people left, and then we just have to get the, the probability vector uh, right. 
Now, if we just wrote P2 through PK, uh, that would be a common mistake, but it should be easy to see that that's a mistake because those don't add up to one. So it can't just be P2 through PK, right? So I'm, I'm imagining that, you know, I've, I've taken, and it doesn't matter wh which people, I mean, I can imagine, I'm conditioning on the, on the count, but, but then I could, I could further condition on which specific people are in category one and then use symmetry. So I guess, I mean, so I may as well just assume that the first N, my, the first N1 people are in, the, are in category one. Okay, but, but, but uh, to get these p's, well then we have to think conditionally, right? So, so let, let, let's call the, this, this vector, um, let's call it p2 prime through pk prime, where somehow we have to figure out what, what's p2 prime and so on, because without the primes it doesn't add up to one, makes no sense. So let's find p2 prime, for example. Intuitively, I want this to be proportional to P2, right? Because I know how many people are in the first party, but that shouldn't kind of affect the relative distribution of the rest of the party. So basically, I just have to renormalize. But if I want to write that out mathematically, I would say P2 equals the probability of, of being in category two given that that, you know, a, a random object being in category two, given that it's not in category one. Because we've restricted to the, we've already thrown out the ones that are in category one. So just by the definition of conditional probability, being in category two, I take the intersection of this and this, but, but it's redundant. Once you say you're in category two, you know you're not in category one, so that's redundant. So the numerator is just P2, and the denominator is one minus P1. That is just the probability of not being in category one. Or we could also write it as P2 over P2 plus blah, 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 plus PK. So, so all this says is we, we've taken these, and you know, similarly for the other ones, PJ prime equals PJ over P2 plus blah, 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 plus PK. All this says is that we've renormalized this. It's still multinomial. Okay, so multinomials have really nice properties like this, and you can see these things just by thinking about it, what, what it means without doing a calculation. So um, that's a very useful distribution um, for lot, lot, lots of applications. Okay, so um, we'll say more about the multinomial uh, in the next lecture or the lecture after, but I wanted to do one more continuous uh, example uh, as well, uh, an example where we actually do need to do a calculation. And this is another kind of famous one. Um, good example of do, doing, how do we work with joint, joint PDFs, which, I, which I, th I, think, I think we need more practice with, or at least you need more practice with, and I try to help with that. So this is a good example. Um, I call this the Cauchy interview problem. I call it the Cauchy interview problem, uh, not because Cauchy asked this as an interview problem, um, but because it, it sounds more interesting to call it that than the Cauchy problem. Um, but actually this is, a, this, I have, for some reason, and this doesn't seem like it should be a common interview problem, but I've actually seen this on uh, several occasions asked as an interview problem, just, just I, think, I think to test whether you can do work with joint PDFs and you know, things, things like that. So, uh, this is, so, okay, so it is an interview problem, although it sort of shouldn't be in some sense. Um, anyway, I have to tell you what the Cauchy, I mean, Cauchy was a famous mathematician, but in this context, Cauchy is referring to a specific distribution. Um, the Cauchy distribution Uh, it, it's a famous distribution that, that has a, 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 lot, a lot of, of kind of weird, uh, scary pro properties. Uh, I, I just got some of these like distribution uh, plushies that I found online. Uh, I, I was gonna, I might bring them, but they're a little bit small to, to show you here. But the coach, the, the, if you come to my office hours, if you can see them in my office, um, they're li li little pillows illustrating different distributions. 
I have them in my office. The koshi is called the evil koshi. And it looks pretty evil. Now what, what, what could, so let me first tell you what the distribution is and then tell you a little bit about what, why is it evil. And then we'll try to find its PDF, which as I said, has been a common interview problem. Find, find the PDF of a koshi. That, that's the problem, okay? So the koshi is the distribution of, let's say, x over y with x and y uh, iid standard normal. So the, it's a simple definition. Just, just take a ratio of two iid standard normals and we call that a Cauchy. And you can see why, you know, that could be a useful distribution for a lot of different applications where, you know, ratios is a pretty natural thing. Uh, so that's a Cauchy. And the problem is fi find the PDF. of this random variable, okay? Let's, let's, let's call this thing t. Find PDF of t. So we're defining t to be the ratio of IID standard normals. We want to find its PDF. Uh, all right, so that doesn't yet answer why this is evil. Well, some properties of the Cauchy that we're not going to prove right now, but just to kind of, you know, foreshadow what, why, why is this thing so evil. Well, first of all, it does not have an expected value. We try to compute e, uh, expected value, it'll blow up. You know, you know that's not that evil. There, you know, there are a lot of distributions where, where if you try to compute the expected value, it blows up. Okay, so it doesn't have a mean, it doesn't have a variance. Uh, the thing that's really evil about the Cauchy is that if you take IID Cauchy's, so let's say we don't just have T, we have T1 through Tn, they're just IID ratios of normals. Uh, you, when, when we get to the law of large numbers later in the course, we'll, we'll see that when we, when we average a bunch of IID random variables, we, what, what happens if we average a lot of them is that that should be close to, to, to their mean, right? You average a lot, a lot of IID things, it should be close to, to the mean. In this case, there is no mean. But, but the weird fact is that if you average all these Cauchy's, IID Cauchy's, the distribution of that average is still a Cauchy. It doesn't change the distribution. You're gonna add, so average a million IID Cauchy's is still gonna be Cauchy. So in some, some sense, you, uh, that, 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 that's kind of, you know, you're hoping sort of like as you collect more and more data, you're hoping to converge to the truth in some sense. In this case, if, if all you do is the average, then you're just not getting anywhere. You're, the distribution doesn't change. Uh, there are other ways to work with, if, if you had Cauchy data, there are other ways to, to work with it. It would be a bad idea to just take the, you know, naively average everything. There are other things you could do. Um, okay, so anyway, that's the Cauchy distribution. Now, let, let's find the PDF, uh, just for practice with our, our joint distributions. And there are several ways we could do this. Uh, one way would be to use the law of total probability and condition on y to, to make things easier. And that's a perfectly good way to do it. Um, but I, I think I want to just start by practicing just more directly how to just directly get the, the CDF. Let's find the CDF and take the derivative and get the PDF. Okay, so let's just try to, oh, well also for the, I mean the CDF, we, we could use the law of total probability, but let's just directly write down, it's gonna be a double integral because we have an x and a y and let, let's just write down that double integral and see if we can do it. Okay, so uh, let's find the CDF. Um, so the probability that x over y is less than or equal to some number t, that's what we need for the CDF. So just practice with, you know, we have, we have some, this is an event. It's the event that the ratio is less than or equal to t. We want to find some probability of an event where, where it's based on x and y. So, so unless we can think of some clever trick for simplifying this, we basically have to do a double integral, or, or, else, or else we can use the law of total probability and then do a single integral, but I don't, actually don't think that's any easier here. Uh, so my first impulse would be to multiply both sides by y here. We have to be careful in doing that because y could be negative. So we can simplify this a little bit by using symmetry first and putting absolute values. This, this follows from, from the symmetry of the, of the normal. And, and you can think through for yourself exactly how I'm using sy symmetry here, but, but the basic idea is, is with the normal, if, 
you know, if I have a, n a standard normal, if I multiply it by minus one, it's still standard normal. If I multiply it random, if I randomly choose, say, with probably one half multiply it by minus one, with probably one half do nothing, it's still standard normal. I have the same symmetry in the denominator, so we sort of have two symmetric things, and, and we may as well just kind of absorb the, the pluses and minuses and, and write it this way. Follows from, from symmetry. The reason I wanted to do that is just, is just so that I could write this as x less than or equal to t absolute y without, you know, having to flip the inequality or worrying about whether the inequality flips. Now let's, let's just write this down as a double integral. Okay, we're, we're saying that x, uh, so we could either do dx dy or dy dx, but let, 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 let's suppose that we're doing dx dy, and to, to get a probability, uh, what do we do? We, we integrate the joint PDF o over whatever region we, we want. Okay, so y goes from minus infinity to infinity. And the, the main thing, again, to be careful about is the limits of integration. x, the inner limits can, can depend on y, and x is, we're looking at the region that goes up to t absolute y, so x goes from minus infinity to t absolute y, and then what we're integrating is just the joint PDF. Right? So, so the joint PDF is, you know, 1 over root 2 pi e to the minus x squared over 2. And then same thing for the, for the y, 1 over root 2 pi e to the minus y squared over 2, because they're, they're IID standard normal. Um, so the, the, the other term, e to the minus y squared over 2, doesn't depend on x. So I could write it here, but I can immediately then pull it out here. So I may as well write it here so that it's not interfering with this part. So that's e to the minus y squared over 2, and there's another 1 over root 2 pi that I'll just, just stick over there. So all I did was write, write down you know, the normal PDF for x and the normal PDF for y, and I took out the, the y part because that doesn't depend on x. That, that looks pretty ugly, so let, let, let's see if we can do it. Well, one, one thing that we could simplify is, is just recognizing kind of what, what, what do we actually have here. Uh, so we have this integral minus infinity to infinity, e to the minus y squared over 2. And then we have this inner integral. Okay, now in one sense, we can't do this integral. Because, you know, that, that's the normal PDF, and you can prove that you can't do that integral. In another sense, you, not only can you do that integral, you already know what that integral is, right? That's just capital phi evaluated here. That's just the normal CDF. So actually it's just phi, uh, so depending on whether you consider that doing the integral or not, uh, it's just that, dy. That's just the definition of the standard normal CDF, okay? Uh, now th these absolute value signs are a little bit annoying, so let, 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 let's uh, notice that we have an even function because y squared, absolute value y, this is an even function. So we may as well go from 0 to infinity instead and multiply by 2. So then we'd have a square root of 2 over pi. Um, I just multiplied by 2. And then, and then we're going from 0 to infinity, e to the minus y squared over 2, capital phi of ty dy. All right, and then, you know, the clock is ticking on our job interview, and we get here, and we sort of po possibly start to panic in that uh, capital Phi is an intractable integral. That's why we called it capital Phi, is because we couldn't do it. And now, now you're being asked in your interview to integrate an integral that you couldn't do. Uh, sounds pretty bad. However, one thing that might help is that uh, on the interview, we were asked to find the PDF, not to find the CDF. That's the CDF. Now, we know that the PDF is the derivative of the CDF, 
So the PDF is the derivative of the integral of an integral that we can't do. So somehow maybe that will save us. So let's take the derivative. So here's the PDF. PDF is the derivative of the CDF. As a fun, right, this thing is, is, is capital F of T, if, if we call the CDF capital F. The PDF is, is the derivative F prime of T. So we're taking the derivative with respect to T, not with respect to Y, which would make no sense. Notice that this Y is a dummy variable, okay? This is a function of T. We're taking the derivative with respect to T. Okay, now there, there's, a, you know, there's a theorem in calculus that says it, that you know, under some pretty mild conditions, that is, if, if you have a reasonably well-behaved uh, thing that you're integrating, you can exchange the derivative and the integral. This is a very, very well-behaved function, because you know, this either, capital phi is just, it's just, it's a continuous differentiable thing between zero and one, e to the minus y squared over two, you know, that's infinitely differentiable, it, it decays to zero very fast, so, so this is a very, very nice function. So there's gonna be no technical problem whatsoever with swapping the derivative and the integral. So we're gonna take the derivative of this with respect to uh, t, and then we're gonna uh, try to simplify it. So we take the derivative, bring, bring the derivative inside, okay? So, so we have the integral, um, zero to infinity, e to the minus y squared over two. That, we're, we're differentiating with respect to t. On the, we're bringing in a d, you know, with respect to dt. So we're treating e to the minus y squared over two just behaves as a constant when we're differentiating with respect to t. And we take the derivative of capital phi of ty by the chain rule, uh, y is gonna come out, because we're differentiating with respect to t, so a y is gonna come out from the chain rule, y. And then we just need the derivative of this, but the derivative of the standard normal CDF is the standard normal PDF, which is one over root two pi e to the minus, you know, z squared over two in general, where, where z is two ty, so it's e to the minus t squared y squared over two. I just, just squared this thing, divide by two, dy. Now let's see if we can do it. Uh, so the square root of two here cancels this square root of two. We have square root of pi, square root of pi, so we're gonna get one over pi. And then we just need to integrate from zero to infinity of y e to the minus t squared y squared over two dy. Uh, now this looks like an integral we can do. The other what? Uh, say that again? There's another e to the minus y squared over two. Oh yeah, I forgot that one, thank you. There's another, well I'll just combine that one with this one. So that would be one, uh oh, I guess I don't get hired, that's sad. Um, there's another e to the minus y squared over two that I forgot, but, but now I thank you, I, I put it back, okay? Um, I, I haven't interviewed for any jobs in like, since I came here five years ago, so I'm kind of rusty. Um, so I, I put back the e to the minus y squared over two uh, that, that you helped me with, and now, now that should be okay, right? Now this is an integral we, we can do. Because, because we know that the derivative of y squared is gonna be two y, and that's gonna be taken care of there. Now it's an easy u substitution again. So we could just let u equal, let's say, uh, one plus t squared y squared over two. Just make that substitution. So, th so then this just becomes e to the minus u, okay? So du equals uh, one plus t squared uh, times, here, here, right now we're treating t as constant again. We're, we're you know, we're, we're looking at, uh, we're changing the variable y, you know, uh, tra transforming it to u. So the derivative of y squared over two is, is y. So we have y times one plus t squared dy. So, so we're, we're just missing, so we have the y dy. We're just missing the one plus t squared, 
Okay? So, so I'll just multiply and divide by 1 plus t squared. Then we're just integrating e to the minus u du, which is a very, very easy integral. We know that that's 1, either just by doing it or because it's the integral of the exponential PDF again. Uh, okay, so then we, then we immediately now have the answer, 1 over pi uh, 1 plus t squared for all t. So that's the PDF. If we wanted the CDF, all we would have to do is integrate this, and you know it's going to be some arctangent thing. Uh, all right, so so that that that's the Cauchy, and um, let me just quickly s just show you how how you would start the the other method, which would be the the uh, law of total probability. I'm not going to do the whole thing because at some point that that that's just going to reduce back to this method. But ju just to show you what it would look like. Uh, just as a quick alternative, without going through the whole thing because it's going to be similar, but it's useful to have both methods. So this would be the method using the double integral, okay? And that, that's the PDF. Oh, we, by the way, we should check that that's a valid PDF. Does it integrate to, to one? Well, if you integrate that thing, you'll, you, you know, you'll get an arctangent thing, and, and, and you can check that when you evaluate the, the arctangent thing, you know, you, you will get one. Okay, so just one, uh, quickly, the alternative using the law of total probability x less than or equal to t absolute value of y. You kind of just, just, just you know, think to yourself, you know, what, what, what do we wish that we knew here? We, we could decide to condition on x, or we could decide to condition on y. Um, this is going to be the integral. Let, 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 let's, let's say we condition on y. Uh, probability x less than or equal to t absolute value of y, given, let's say, y equals y. This, this would be the law of total probability, right? Just conditioning. We can choose whether to condition on x or condition on y, but I think I want to condition on y. OK, law of total probability, remember the discrete case. We just you know sum over all cases, p of a given you know b whatever, p of b whatever. You know, we, have, we have a partition. And in this case, we're integrating instead of summing. So we're conditioning on y, and then we're multiplying by phi of y. Lowercase phi of y is, is, the, is the standard normal PDF. All right, well, d d let's see if, if this helps at all. This is saying to treat y as just being known to equal little y, OK? So I can plug in plug in little y there. And then the, the tricky part here is that, is that, is that we, we need to use the fact that x is independent of y. Because if x are not independent of y, you could plug this thing in, but then you're still, you still have this condition, OK? But since they're independent, you can plug in y equals little y and then get rid of the condition because they're independent. So when we do that, that's, that's just going to be phi, the probability that x is less than or equal to t absolute value of y is just phi of t absolute value y, just by definition, right? Because we're plugging in y, that's just a constant. x less than or equal, probability of x less than or equal to some constant, it's just the standard normal CDF evaluated there, phi of y dy, which I think is the same as, as the in integral we had. Does that look the same? Yeah, yeah. So, so over there, I just wrote out what, what this is, but it's the same thing. And then proceed in the same way. So that would be a, a second way to, to, to do this. We'll, we'll see a third way uh, later on, just because this is a common interview question. So it's good to have more than three or more than two ways to do it. All right, so I'll, I'll stop for now. Uh, I'll see you, see you Wednesday.